So the title of the talk, Tefra, by the way, I was asked to give this talk. This is not my title. Uh, Tefra from creation to deposition. I would prefer to call it a life of Tefra, birth to burial. <laughs> All right, get this sorted out. Sigurd Thoransson, he was the pioneer for Tefra chronology. He laid the founding principles of the subject, and also he defined the word tephra. He was the first person to introduce that word uh, as a collective term for all airborne pyroclasts. It's a term that doesn't replace any of the pre-existing terms. Uh, it complements it. And we still use terms like ignimbrite, world of tough and pumice, in the way we originally defined them. So it's an umbra, tephra is an umbra term, and it is now in very widespread use, as we all know. Thoransen defined also tephra chronology in a very simple way, uh, a geological chronology based on the measuring, interconnection, and dating of volcanic ash layers. In today's parlance, we would say a geological chronology based on characterization, correlation, and dating. And he recognized clearly the importance of these tephra layers. He actually did his PhD in um, the field of palynology, where he was looking at uh, post-glacial uh, vegetation history in Iceland, and came across all these tephra layers and immediately realized the importance from the stratigraphic point of view. And so, he, as he says here, uh, a momentary uh, formation, very wide dispersal, characteristic appearance, make good geological guide horizons. Tephra chronology can be conveniently broken down into two uh, uh, fields, if you like, tephra stratigraphy and tephra chronometry. Uh, these are the fields that very much embrace tephra stratigraphy, stratigraphy, sedimentology, volcanology, mineralogy, petrology, geochemistry, and then under the tephra chronometry, the various forms of dating methods, and also importantly, paleomagnetism. So the practice of tephra chronology embraces uh, many of the branches of earth science, and it follows therefore that whereas tephra chronology requires the expertise from these topics, it can be a two-way street that tephrochronology also can contribute uh, importantly to these separate fields. And that's uh, obviously the, one of the main thrusts of this meeting, as Marcus has says, is to try and develop the connections and potential synergies of tephrochronology and physical volcanology and other branches of earth science. So in this example, we, we're demonstrating tephrochronology as a two-way street with physical volcanology. We talked about this yesterday in our discussion at our last stop, and this just reiterates what we mentioned there, that many of the characteristics of a volcanic eruption can be derived from physical properties of the fallout area, properties like thickness, grain size, maximum size of class, density, porosity, uh, component analysis, and so on. That we can, from this type of information which physical volcanologists collect, but also, in part, tephrochronologists too, we can derive very much information on the nature, characteristics of the eruptions. And a point we made yesterday, which I think is really important, is that physical volcanologists tend to work of necessity in the source areas, uh, probably no more than 150 kilometers from source, and the Tephrochronologists typically are working in very distal regions, 500 or over 1,000 kilometers from source. So that on occasion, the, to these data sets can be linked to get a better idea of an eruption. And I'll give you an example of that from my own research. Uh, we've been doing work over the last oh, 20 years or so in Yukon and central Alaska on distal tephra beds. And around the Golden Klondike gold fields, there's a tephra bed that's very thick and widespread throughout the Klondike. We call it the Dawson tephra, and we published a few short papers on it. Um, the volcanology group in Anchorage um, obviously became aware of that, 
and they'd been working at that time on a volcanic region near Eamon's Lake, and Christy would know all about this. And they felt, given the age of what they were working on and what we described in the Dawson City area, that we may have a distal correlative. And so I sent them a big bag of uh, the tephra. They did mineral chemistry, glass chemistry, and sure enough, it was a dead ringer for the Dawson tephra. So through cooperation of those two groups, we immediately derived a much better understanding of the uh, eruption and the magnitude in particular of the eruption. And as you can see from this photograph, the tephra in the Klondike gold fields is here about 25 centimeters thick. It's reworked, but all over the area, this tephra is very thick, widespread. So it's a major, large magnitude eruption to which both physical volcanologists and tephraconologists have contributed to get a good understanding of that eruption. Another example, uh, some work I've been doing with colleagues on the Toba tephraconology of the Toba Tufts, uh, in particular the youngest Toba Tuff. Physical volcanologists have worked in the source area uh, through here. This is the Toba Caldera complex in northern Sumatra. And the stratigraphy, the geochronology has been done in the source area. And so we have, they have defined these three major units, YTT, MTT, and OTT, from 75, 500 to 800,000 years. But it's not the physical volcanologists that have defined the magnitude of the fallout zone. It's largely the work of other disciplines, oceanographers, archaeologists, especially in India, uh, paleoecologists, um, a variety, large variety of expertise has been brought to bear to get a really good understanding of the distribution of this YTT, and also, of course, giving us a better understanding of the magnitude of that particular eruption, believed to be probably the largest eruption in the last three million years. These very large, uh, extensive, widely distributed tephra beds are very, very useful stratigraphic markers. It goes without saying. I use the YTT as an example of the broad applications that this tephra has, and by analogy, other widespread tephras. But in the case of YTT, the mineralogy and chemistry that is being done on these distal units is information that's clearly relevant to those interested in the geochemical evolution of large magma bodies. Studies are going on extensively at the moment, as some of you are well aware because you're involved with it. The archaeological sites, the tephras are providing important information for age control on the archaeology. Others are working on the impact of that eruption on, on environment and humans. Age and correlation of deep sea sediments in the surrounding oceans. These tephra beds are providing extremely useful guidelines in the marine environment. Calibration of climate and paleomagnetic changes have been the YTT and also the OTT, very important in this respect. And then also these very widespread tephras have occurrences in terrestrial mean and in some cases ice core sequences. So we're linking these disparate environments together in time. Extremely useful applications. Tephrochronology has a two-way street, as I've just indicated, uh, with chemical volcanology, geochemistry, and petrogenesis. Insights into the development of large-scale magma chambers. And I can give you an example of that here. Work that uh, my colleague Nick Pierce and I, and Emma Gatti and others, have been doing of late relate to the glass chemistry of YTT. Earlier studies, including our own, indicated, sorry, sorry, indicated that the um, glass was a homogeneous population. And we noted a few outliers, but we always considered it a homogeneous population. And it was very similar in composition to the OTT, which is an order, order of magnitude older. And so it was very difficult um, to differentiate these two units. 
So <clears throat> Nick and I decided we'd do an extensive study to really try and establish once and for all whether glass chemistry could be used to separate YTT and OTT. And we ran literally hundreds of analyses. This data set that you see here, eight, over 800 analyses. And we found to our surprise four separate glass populations. Primary populations because they occur, each of these populations occur in a widespread distribution. India, Malaysia, Indian Ocean, in the source calderas, all these four populations are present. So this obviously informs those that are interested in the nature of the magma chamber and the evolution of the magma chamber in terms of its chemistry. Again, the two-way street between tephrochronology and uh, volcanology. Importantly, too, it's been realized by a number of workers looking at the marine sedimentary record that tephras are extremely well preserved in the marine environment. Um, work of Ninkovich in the 70s, of um, Scheidegger in the Pacific Ocean, North, North uh, East Pacific Ocean in the 80s, and the ANU group, uh, Brandt and Angelus, working just south of uh, Japan on the, the deep sea set of uh, tephras there. They have showed that these tephras are preserved in a pristine condition, and therefore you have these very long records going back, in, in the cases of our show, over 30 million years, where you have a record over this long period of time of magma compositional changes, uh, tectonic changes, all preserved in this tephra record. Let me illustrate this by one example. This is the work of Bryant and others from ANU. They, they looked at the Izu uh, Bonin volcanic arc here, just south of Japan, and also they um, had uh, tephra samples from the DSTP cores here in the Mariana Trench. And the record they show is that in the Izu area, this light blue trend, this is potassium oxide against silica here, and you can see you have a low potassium trend here that's very stable for over the last 36 million years. And note, note the linear trends here, because uh, what does that linearity mean in terms of condition of the glass, the quality of the analyses? So we start, the, the Izu Bonin looks very stable, and the, the interpretation is that there's been a very stable tectonic environment over the last 36 million years in this particular arc. But when you look at the Marianas data, they have three uh, trends on this uh, K uh, silica plot. They have this orange trend, which is the greater than 30 million years, and you can see a low potassium trend. And then from 30 million years to 13 million years, you see a high potassium trend. And then younger than 6 million, you have more intermediate values of potassium. And these very significant compositional changes are related by these authors to tectonism in the um, Marianas Arc region. So these tephras are giving very uh, useful information in terms of the long-term chemical evolution of magma systems associated with these volcanic arcs, and also, in this case, giving us some idea of tectonic stability in these volcanic arc regions. So now I'd like to begin the tale of tephra, if you like, uh, focus on these silicic subaerial paraclastic eruptions. And here then I'm titling this, this is the creation event. We have a magma body that starts to rise through the crust. This may be initiated by earth movements or the injection at the base or a lower down of basaltic magma. For one reason or another, uh, the magma starts to rise, obviously promoted by buoyancy forces. And as the confining pressure drops, the volatiles in the melt will dissolve, and we'd have these gas bubbles developing in the magma. As again, they continue to rise, confining pressure drops, more and more gas bubbles form as a result of excess solution. And the pressure in these gas bubbles will tend to increase as the confining pressure drops. But it's limited by 
the surface tension between the melt and the gas phase, and also the fact as the volatiles exolve out of the melt, the viscosity of the melt is also increasing. So there are these resistive forces that do limit the growth of these bubbles. But eventually, as they rise to the, up the, uh, through the magma, they will fragment. And they will fragment, according to studies that have been done, when the volume of the bubbles to melt is about 70%. Then you'll get fragmentation. And that releases, of course, gas um, into the upper part of the magma chamber or into the volcano, assuming it's got a sealed cap. Gas pressure builds up. Um, tensile strength of the cap rock is um, exceeded, fracturing takes place, and then you get this catastrophic expansion of gases which drives the eruption. And we have here the, the gas jet thrust zone of the eruption column. So that the thermal energy of the magma is being converted into the uh, kinetic energy of the eruption through the expansion, the explosive expansion of these uh, gases. So Tefra is born. And sorry, I'm missing a, yeah, this is the next slide. So we, we continue to look at the eruption column. Uh, this is the gas thrust region, the convective zone here, where the air is being sucked into the hot um, uh, column here with the gas and uh, the um, tephra material, and it goes up into the troposphere, being supported by buoyancy forces. And then when it reaches the tropopause, typically, um, because temperature will start to increase at this point, buoyancy forces reduce, and it will start to, the, the eruptive column will start to splay out like an umbrella, being called the umbrella region. And here's an example from Pericotin. Volcano photograph taken by Ray, Ray Wilcox in 1947. And you can see here there's a small gas thrust zone, then the convective region, and then here the mushroom umbrella region, if you like, with the tephra fallout coming from it. This is a spectacular photograph of the eruption of a uh, redoubt volcano in 1990. And you can see here the uh, convective zone, the mushroom region here, uh, well developed, and the annular cloud that formed as a result of the uh, punch of the eruptive column into the atmosphere, lifting the uh, atmosphere here and condensing to form this annular cloud. And then looking at Andre's work on the St. Helens eruption, this is uh, the diagram of the eruptive column of uh, the mushroom region. And you can see here that that mushroom region developed at an elevation of just below about 20 kilometers. And importantly, the, the spreading force of, from, of this uh, uh, eruptive column, this, the wind direction is moving this way. It's, move, it's being opposed by the wind, but it's strong enough to force the cloud in, into the wind, as it were, and the stagnation point is about 25 kilometers from the vent. So you get tephra fallout upwind from the vent in, these, in this situation. I find this is a useful diagram, diagram by Fisher and Smenke, just to summarize, as it says here, the transport and deposition of the tephras. The eruption column uh, through here and this uh, is, would be your mushroom, uh, the um, umbrella region, and the, the eruptive column is being transported by wind, and as it does so, sedimentary fractionation is taking place. The denser material, the larger material are coming out first, and then the long distance transport, where the material is held in suspension by turbulence, that then carries on downwind into the ultra-distal zones, and it's mostly this very fine, uh, glassy material along with um, sulfuric acid aerosols and other uh, chemicals. So this is the main eruptive column and transport direction and then of course the tephra fallout from it. The eruption, uh, commonly you get these uh, collapse of the eruptive column as the density of the 
column increase to the point where buoyancy forces and the velocity uh, of the eruption through the atmosphere decreases, uh, the column collapses in part to form pyroclastic flows or ignimbrites, as you can see here. Uh, these ignimbrites um, partly become fluidized as a result of the expanding gases and the fines get elutriated up into the upper part of the flow and you get convective clouds of vitric uh, ash um, developing above the flow. And these, of course, are the coignimbritic um, ash or tephra deposits. And many of these large eruptions like Toba, uh, like the big Yellowstone eruptions, uh, which have these huge ignimbrite flows, are uh, believed to have been associated with these very volume uh, very volume-rich um, coignimbritic clouds that uh, had wide, very widespread distribution. Ash flows or pyroclastic flows also develop as a result of so-called boilover. This is where you have an eruption where there's no eruptive column. There's just a boilover of the gas and it's contained tephra, uh, forming a density, density current that uh, travels, uh, hugs the landscape. Uh, and eventually is deposited. Then the small, very local uh, pyroclastic flows associated with dome collapse. So here then we have the fallout deposits. Here we have the pyroclastic flow deposits. I'm not talking about here where you get admixture with water. These uh, column collapse and the resultant pyroclastic flows, uh, can, these flows can be very extensive. Uh, these columns uh, can be 25 kilometers, 30 kilometers high. And when you have collapse from such high elevations, it imparts a lot of kinetic energy into the flow that enables these flows to ride over um, topographic highs several hundred meters high. Uh, most of the deposit being focused in the valleys because it, it is a density current, but some of the finer vitric stuff may well coat some of the uh, topographic highs. And here, again, this is a Mount St. Helens uh, event. Um, very brave photographer took this, obviously. But these are the Douglas fir that we saw yesterday to give you scale. And here you have the ash falling out, or the tephra falling out of the eruptive uh, convective zone of that eruption and uh, eventually sedimenting to form pyroclastic flows. So quickly, let's look at some of these distinguishing features. Airfall as opposed to pyroclastic flow. Mantle bedding uh, in airfall, well sorted, planar internal stratification. These are the dominant uh, characteristics of airfall tephra. I'll show you images of these in a minute. Pyroclastic flows, well, they are density currents, so they're going to hug the low areas of the landscape, fill valleys and depression. If they're extensive enough and thick enough, they'll bury entire landscapes. Uh, poorly to massive sorting, sometimes gas segregation pipes, carbonates wood, uh, thermal oxidation giving a pink color. They may well, may well be welded with Fiami, and also they'll take a thermal remnant magnetism if they are emplaced hot, as they are, of course. They pass through the Curie point and set the Earth field direction. Mantle bedding, classic example. Here again is St. Helens deposit. And you can see the internal planar stratification. There are three eruptive units here. Yesterday we were talking about, uh, in our discussion period, uh, the lithics. Uh, here you've got these three graded units, the lithics at the base, and then pumice uh, concentrated in the upper part of the bed. Lithics and then the pumice rich, pumice nut blocks being larger right near the top of the flow. Probably again, um, you're looking at density differences here. And uh, accretionary lapilli, very characteristic of airfall uh, unit, but not restricted. You can get these also in pyroclastic flows, but they indicate interaction with water. And this is a bed locality. Andre can tell us what the stratigraphic units are. But I show it here because you've got the classic example of an airfall unit showing reasonably good sorting 
Um, you've got some indication here of a planar stratification. And you have this fine, fine vitric cap that Marcus mentioned yesterday in the field, um, which is interpreted as being the fine vitric material that uh, settles out of the atmosphere and it, it uh, accumulates on top of the, uh, the pillion material and then this pyroclastic flow came in. And it, it, but they, you must have had laminar flow at the base because there's no erosion of this uh, aeolian material here or this um, air form material here. And it shows the massive structure of the Ingenbride, very characteristic. Uh, Mesa Falls, uh, Tefra unit here with the gain, the airfall unit with a nice internal stratification, uh, nice to really well sorted, overlain by one, two, three Ignimbrite flows, showing nice reverse grading of the pumice in the lower two flows, and then the main flow overlies it here, showing the massive bedding. Mesa Falls, of course, is about 1.2 MA. And then these ignobrites can be welded. Here's an example from New Zealand showing these steep cliffs, uh, welded uh, ignobrite. And the truck here gives the scale. What the tephrochronologists, I imagine um, geochemists too, are looking for are these non-welded basal zones of these welded ignobrite sequences, because that's where the chemistry is preserved. Um, the stewing that goes on in the ignin bright flow alters the mineralogy, especially the glass, and it's really not useful for tephrochronologic purposes. And so for dating and for uh, tephrochronology, these non-welded zones, which are not very thick, if they're preserved, they're the things to go for. And this is a classic eutaxitic texture of the ignin bright showing these amazing uh, fiami from an example in Ethiopia. The nature of the glass shards, this is a typical bubble wall shards, uh, magmatic uh, in origin. The, some of the magmas, of course, are volatile rich, and you get these more pernicious um, pyroclasts that are generated. And here, I, I believe we might have what I call a phreatomagmatic uh, unit, where the magma is interacted with water, and we see this very low vesicular uh, glass, but it, you have these beautiful planar structures cutting right across the, the, the blocky uh, glass material. And this, I think, might be an indication of a phreatomagmatic origin, the blocky nature of the shards and these planar surfaces that traverse the vesicle. And another characteristic uh, feature you find in airfall units are these um, aggregates very, very common in supervolcanic eruptions. Um, it's believed that in the fine-grained um, ash cloud, van der Waal forces operate, and you get the uh, attraction of these small particles to one another to form these aggregates, which then, of course, settle out of the eruption cloud and uh, accumulate on the surface. And they're preserved uh, in, the, in the record. This particular example is a Yellowstone hotspot track 10 million years old material. And these uh, aggregates are very common. Long distance transport of tephra, depositional environments, and preservation potential. The first slide shows a summary of the work that Sean uh, Pine McDonald and his uh, colleagues are doing, which I think has really altered our um, view of, of how widespread and useful these tephras could be for long distance correlation. Uh, uh, Sean and his colleagues have found tephra in peat bogs in this area here that come from Kamchatka, that come from the eastern Aleutian Arc, that come from the Wrangell volcanic field, that come from the Cascades, all preserved in peat bogs through, and lakes through this area. Also, some of these tephras are in the Greenland ice core and also some have been found in Ireland. So we have this amazing condition now where we can actually use tephra for intercontinental correlation, which is a thing that one 
dreamed about years ago, never thought thought would happen, but the crypto Tefra story is really adding a new dimension to the um, benefits of Tefra chronology and also volcanology because it's telling us more about the distribution and magnitude of these eruptions. We mentioned earlier that the deep sea uh, environment is one that's ideal for tephra preservation. And here is a sequence of late Cretaceous tephras preserved in Arctic Canada, and they're interbedded with black shales. But note, there is no disturbance of these beds in terms of bioturbation. There is no infauna in these sediments. The structure arrangement of the tephras are perfectly preserved. The composition is from rhyolitic to dacitic. Um, uh, very reasonable looking analyses. I've done fission track ages on these, getting a late Cretaceous age, 65 million. So these are very well preserved tephras that are 65 million years old in this marine environment. Tephras can also be preserved in these high energy environments. Don't, when you see a gravel, just don't walk away. Oh, there's no tephra there. You can find tephra, as we have found in the Klondike Goldfields, at a number of localities where you've got uh, sand and gravel sequences. And tephras are commonly preserved in these sandy uh, pods within the gravels. I, I'm a, I could show you many examples of this, uh, but gravel environments, high energy channel environments, you do get a pres a tephra preserved. The issue of reworking is one we always have to work with, whether you're a geochemist, a tephrochronologist, or whether you're a geochronologist, because tephra characteristically is contaminated. It has contaminants derived from the vent walls, xenocrystic material. It has contaminants that once it's been emplaced, it will pick up detrital material and deposit it um, downslope somewhere, but it has a contamination. And that's why in tephrochronology, and obviously in geochronology, you have to work with these grain-specific techniques. Reworking obviously is very clear when you have deposits that are over 700 kilometers from the source vent, which in this case is the Yellowstone hotspot track, and you have these tephra sequences three meters thick. Well, obviously, there's a rework. You see this by the bedding, uh, the ripple structures that are common through here. The, the massive stuff is about one foot below where these uh, guys are digging, and uh, that's the, where the original material is. So reworking, obviously, really readily recognized by th the uh, unusual thicknesses. But in, in India, there's a lot of work now being done on the Toba Tefra from the archaeological standpoint. And what's happened there is the interesting development of the use of luminescent dating methods to determine whether you're looking at primary or reworked uh, occurrences of the YTT. We know the age of YTT. Many uh, different labs have dated this as 75K. But the issue is that when you do thermal luminescence methods, you get dates as young as 27, 23 Ka, and in this locality here, 40 Ka. These are times clearly when the tephra was reworked and re deposited in, in a new environment, and it, these thermal luminescent states simply records the last cycling of that particular tephra. And then finally, the alteration of volcanic ash. Yes, I've been commenting on the fact that in the ocean environment, the deep sea record environment, we do get these um, situations where very old uh, tephra beds have been remarkably well preserved. But that's not to say tephra does not alter. Of course, glass is very reactive and it breaks down readily uh, in many environments. And here in New Zealand, you can see off the bat, what used to be a nice tephra sequence is just a sequence of different colored clays. So that, yep, yeah, alterations uh, does take place and one has to be careful with it. Um, it's a tephra I've worked on recently, a middle Eocene unit in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And it's, uh, we dated 38 million years old by fission tracks. And you can see that 
it's altered, it's got what I call altered skin. I think this is interstratal solution that's taking place. And, but when we do probe analyses on these glass, looking at the interior of these shards, you get very respectable analyses. There are two beds very close to one another, and you can see that these are very respectable uh, rhyolitic glasses. One thing pointing out here is that, yeah, the sodium, the dispersion of the sodium data is high here, um, that being the most difficult element in terms of its mobility. But even in this example, it's a very respectable um, standard uh, deviation here. So these analyses look very respectable. And the, that's the beauty of the probe method, is that you can avoid the skin alteration effects by probing in the center of the shards. There has been a reluctance on the part of some workers to avoid the use of alkali elements in the uh, characterization of tephras. And I think, I think that's a good thing to be very cautious. But I think uh, to make a decision a priori that this is not a good thing to do is wrong. Because in many situations that we found, and I work certainly with the Yukon and Alaskan distal tephras, we get very tight distributions showing um, very tight compositions indicating clearly that sodium and potassium here are giving us real true values. And the same with this unit here. So sodium and potassium as elements in characterization can be very useful. And my last slide shows again the work of Ninkovich on these deep sea sediments. And one thing it shows is that when glass shards hydrate, and here you can see values of uh, this is the water, and by difference, probe analyses, and it's at four to five weight percent water in these deep sea tephras here. But the, these are the anhydrous analyses, and you can see here that, for example, silica uh, it tends to 77 to about 75. Again, these are anhydrous results. Um, calcium, very, very limited. Uh, showing very consistent data. Sodium, again, remarkably, very consistent data. This stuff here is 7 million years old. This stuff here is about uh, 400,000 years old. So this is the top of the core, the lower part of the core. And so these analyses again indicate that we've got good chemistry on these distal tephras in these deep sea records and that the hydration of these glass shards is not affecting the element concentrations. That's it. Thank you.